After the 1940 evacuation from Dunkirk, the British look for new ways to combat the Germans until they can raise a huge army for an invasion force. Prime Minister Winston Churchill looks to the chiefs of staff to propose measures for a ceaseless offensive against the whole German-occupied coastline, leaving a trail of German corpses behind. They decide on commandos, specially trained troops of the hunter class who can develop a reign of terror down the enemy coast. I'm Indy Nidell. This is a World War II in real time special episode about British commando units. Commandos are actually used by the British before Dunkirk, looking into unconventional warfare for the Military Intelligence Research Department. Researchers were interested in a different type of soldier. By the spring of 1940, they have approval to recruit 10 new guerrilla companies from other army units. These are first deployed in Norway in April and then in Belgium during the Dunkirk evacuation. They proved their value, blowing up 200,000 tons of fuel in Harfleur, after which Churchill asks for the specifically trained hunter class on the 4th of June, 1940. This is the active beginning of the commandos. The Special Service Brigade is founded, commanded by J.C. Hayden. Now, because Special Service has the initials SS, like the Nazi units, some prefer the term commandos, but both are used. Anyhow, the brigade quickly grows to 10 battalion-sized commando units, drawn from volunteers from the Norwegian guerrilla companies and from British territorial divisions. Recruiters from military operations put out calls, looking for soldiers who are able to swim, are immune from air and seasickness, able to drive motor vehicles, with courage, physical endurance, active, marksmanship, self-reliance, and an aggressive spirit towards war, and must become experts in the military use of scouting, to stalk, to report everything taking place, to move across any type of country, day or night, silently and unseen, and to live off the land for considerable periods. Shortly after their establishment, they set out on their first missions, with varied success. Operation Ambassador, a raid on German barracks on Guernsey in July 1940, sees some units land on the wrong island, and those who do make it to the barracks find that it has been abandoned. A more successful raid is Operation Claymore in March 1941, in which Commando Numbers 3 and 4 destroy 11 ships, factories, and a lot of resources on the Norwegian Lofoten Islands. They also managed to capture around 100 German POWs and enemy codebooks and encryption equipment. Other 1941 operations are those of lay force. This is under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Laycock, hence the name lay force. Commandos number 7, 8, and 11 join Middle East Commandos 50 and 52 to support operations there, totaling roughly 2,000 men. They engage in action in North Africa in a raid on Italian positions in Bardia, with mixed results. Soon, though, they find themselves fighting as infantry in the Battle of Crete, much to Churchill's dislike because that is not their intended use. Lacking equipment and training for a long defensive campaign, they lose most of their numbers. The survivors of Force will, within months, be part of the foundations of the Special Air Service, SAS. It isn't until 1942 that the commando branch truly comes into its own. First of all, it's only now that the commandos get their own dedicated training grounds. Achnacarry in the Scottish Highlands is dubbed the Commando Basic Training Center. Before March 1942, new commandos are trained somewhat ad hoc by their commanding officers. This results in, well, in wide-ranging skill sets and varying levels of quality. The new school is run by Lieutenant Colonel Charles Vaughn, a World War I veteran who has designed a physically and mentally demanding course to drill the volunteers into the best of the best. The drills build on the doctrine of Brigadier Hayden, who led the commandos for the first two years of their existence, but has since been replaced by Lord Mountbatten. Emphasis still lies on stealthy raids, but recruits are expected to be superb fighters and great soldiers. One instructor recalls how Vaughn accepted nothing but the best, whether it be fitness, weapon training and musketry, fieldcraft and tactics, drill and turnout, or even 
in the more apparently mundane matters of administration, which included feeding and hygiene. Together, all these factors made the whole and the self-disciplined and reliant commando soldier fit to fight and fighting fit with high morale, willing and capable of tackling any military task under any circumstances and against any odds. The recruits are trained in unarmed combat, bayonet fighting, navigational skills, rock climbing, and living off the land. Because of the marine nature of their deployment, they train in the use of landing craft, canoes, and other boat types on nearby Loch Lochy. Additional attention is given to swimming, which might seem trivial until you realize that many missions end with the soldiers having to swim back to their naval escort boats, often in cold, rough seas, and often at night. Some commandos receive additional training in Arctic combat, for which a second training camp at Braemar in Scotland is opened late in 1942. Famous mountaineer Frank Smythe designed a course in which recruits learn how to survive in a sub-zero climate, complete with lessons in skiing, mountaineering, and elevated combat. Most training is conducted with live ammunition and in full battle gear, including obstacle courses and long nighttime marches. The course ends with a hyper-realistic simulated beach landing on the coast of Scotland. An interesting footnote here, until the Achnacarry school opened, the commandos all wore their own regimental insignia and caps. With the argument that this doesn't do team spirit any good, a local Scot is asked to design a new uniform beret in Lovat Green. From then on, green berets will become a visual hallmark of the elite units. But at the core of what makes a commando are his weapons and his tactics. Hit and run, smash and grab, butcher and bolt, just some of the simple ways to describe what a commando does. Their main methods revolve around making a quick, stealthy entrance without alarming the enemy. Their tasks most often are to destroy something, gather intelligence, take prisoners, or some combination of all three. They are then to leave the way they came, often via seaborne extraction. This usually doesn't all take longer than 24 hours. Their equipment reflects that with emphasis on clubs and knives, like the specifically developed Fairburn Sykes fighting knife or Lee Enfield rifles, often with an added sniper scope. Grenades and weapons with high stopping power and a high firing rate, like the Thompson submachine gun with a 20 round box magazine and light machine guns like the 303 Bren are used to sow as much chaos as possible when it does come to a gunfight. The commando formations are not really trained in using any defensive tactics though. They lack anything bigger than light personal arms. So they really can't engage with an organized enemy in a defensive position. They do some serious damage though. Throughout 1942 and 1943, they carry out numerous hit and run operations all over the globe. They are active in Europe, East Asia, North Africa, and the Arctic. The commandos themselves are increasingly diverse as well. After the initial imprisonment of enemy aliens, German and Austrian Jews even now serve in the Enter Allied Commando No. 10, together with volunteers from other occupied territories. Their raids can be pretty spectacular. In January 1942, Number 62 Commando engages in Operation Postmaster. They seize three Italian and German ships, including a tanker, in the neutral Spanish port of Santa Isabel on Fernando Po Island. In March that year, the greatest operation of all time, Operation Chariot, sees the French coast town of San Nazaire raided by Number 2 Commando. It's a daring episode in which the destroyer, HMS Campbelltown, packed with explosives, rams through the gates of the docks of San Nazaire. In the chaos, the commandos go out to destroy as many facilities as they can, like the pumping station and another dry dock gate. Hours after departure, the timed explosives go off, taking out the dry dock for the remainder of the war, effectively barring the Germans from housing their largest capital ships there, as it is the only port on that coast that could do so before that. Such a result doesn't come without losses though, as a total of 169 commandos and many servicemen are killed and many more than that are taken prisoner. 
But soon, the role of the commandos starts to shift. From 1943 on, coastal raids will become less important. See, when the Allies start taking the initiative and preparing larger scale landings, the idea of coastal raiding will become less and less relevant for the Allied war effort. Instead, commando training will increasingly include defensive infantry tactics. Their equipment changes accordingly. They will receive, well, more firepower, like a larger number of Bren guns, two and three inch mortars, and anti-armor weapons like the projector infantry anti-tank guns, Piat. They will also have motorized vehicles like jeeps, motorcycles, and trucks to make them more mobile. However, the emphasis of their combat will always remain on bold and aggressive tactics, stealth, hand-to-hand -hand combat, and ambush. Their methods very much inspire other army units, including the U.S. Army Rangers, many of whom also received training at Achnakari. The word commando will live on as a synonym for an elite soldier, a name still carried proudly by such units worldwide. While fighting on Crete in 1941, the British commandos encountered Fallschirmjäger, a German elite fighting force. We made a special episode about them as well, which you can see right here whenever it pops up. We are able to do these episodes thanks to our amazing Time Ghost Army, so hurry up and join. We want you, you know, whatever. However, the posters, I don't know which arm. I think it's the right arm. Anyhow, you can join us at timeghost.tv or patreon.com and you can go over to Indy's Tie Barn where you can see all of the fantastic ties that I wear in these shows that we put up for auction each and every week in case there's one that suits your wardrobe. And do not forget to subscribe. I'll see you next time. Ooh.